Okay, we have started the process of looking at the whole, what the Bible teaches concerning uh, being witnesses and witnessing. And we're in the front end of this. We've looked at the responsibility explained, and I don't know that you can actually see the print up there, that particular font, all that well, but it says the responsibility enabled. And so there was a point in time when this responsibility uh, was enabled and continues to be enabled today, although we do not experience what was experienced uh, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. That is where we're going. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, and let's look at this passage of Scripture. Uh, Here it is as well. Our Lord had, in explaining the task of being a witness, you shall be my witnesses, and explaining what it was all about, uh, you make disciples, you baptize disciples, you teach disciples, you preach the gospel to every creature, to everyone, in every nation, uh, and you do so under my authority. There are no limits to my authority because all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, you are to go and you are to be my witnesses. So he chooses that word, uh, martyreo, um, as a witness. He doesn't say evangelist, not that there's anything wrong with evangelist. Uh, That's a very good biblical term, but he calls his disciples and he calls his children witnesses. We are witnesses. And so we are to go forth and bear forth witness uh, and do so in the context of all the nations because all authority has been given to Jesus Christ. And he says, as the ultimate authority, I give you this responsibility. I charge you with this responsibility. So you have the latitude and you have the authority and you have the go-ahead to go absolutely everywhere with this message. There are no limitations. Uh, roadblocks will be thrown up by uh, various human authorities, but hey, I am the authority. Therefore, go ahead. It doesn't mean there won't be resistance. It doesn't mean there won't be opposition. It doesn't mean that there won't be those who try to mitigate the witness that uh, you are commanded to give. But all authority is given to me. Therefore, go. Go and be my witnesses. So that's what he explained to them. But in this explanation, he says, before you go, I know you're fired up. And they were after the resurrection, after it began to sink in that Jesus Christ had truly risen from the dead. They were really fired up to get this message out, to declare to their fellow Jews especially that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. But Jesus said, before you go, you must wait. You must wait until the promise of the Spirit of God comes, and He will empower you to do this task. Because as as, as excited and as enthused as you are to declare this message among your brethren, you need supernatural enablement. You need supernatural empowering. I know you can articulate the message. Jesus knew his disciples could articulate the message. He knew they had a grasp of the truths. He knew that they had the enthusiasm factor. But he said, with all of that, you still need God's power. And that will come when the Spirit of God comes upon you. Because what you are engaging in is a battle that is far deeper, far greater, far more extensive than what you can imagine. It is a spiritual battle. You are going to meet resistance that goes well beyond any human resistance that you will encounter. Because behind all of that human resistance are spiritual forces of darkness. There is the evil one and all of his forces who will work and operate against you. You don't see that, you don't feel that, you don't smell that. 
but it's there. And that is the great enemy behind the human enemy. That is the great opposition behind the human opposition. You need power. And not the limited power that you have as a human being. So with all the enthusiasm, with the clarity of the message, with the eyewitness of Jesus Christ risen from the dead, you've seen it, you've seen me, you and I haven't had that privilege. You and I haven't had that experience. We have not seen the risen Christ. But they did. That was part of their life experience. He said, you need spiritual enablement. You need God's power. So he said, wait. Until the power of the Spirit comes upon you, and then you may go. So that's where we're at in Acts chapter 2, just setting the table there. And so in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that's 50 days after Passover, they were all with one accord in one place. And so this is part of the uh, Passover season and the culmination uh, of it all. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So they were gathered there on this day, waiting like they had every other day. They had no idea when the day began that this was a day when the enablement of God was going to come upon them. So they were gathered in obedience, waiting, and they were sitting just like you're sitting, except without the cushioned chairs. <laughs> but they were sitting. And the Spirit of God didn't come in and say, now get up off your duffs because you've just been sitting here. It's about time you got busy. No. Then there appeared to them... To, Divided tongues as a fire, and one set upon each of them. And so there was a visual dimension to this. And Luke describes it as divided tongues. And uh, these divided tongues looked like fire. And uh, one of them set upon each of the people gathered there, each of the believers gathered, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So this was a new experience, being filled with the Spirit. They had to figure out what that was all about, what was going on there. And as a result, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that was a new experience, speaking in tongues. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed. See, that there's a key in verse 6. They, they, everyone heard them speak in his own language. Tongues are languages. Tongues are languages. It's right there. So any other teaching about tongues that is not a language... We're not talking about some made-up heavenly language. We're talking about language that people speak. That's not biblical. That is not from God. That is not of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what this lesson is about this morning. It's not our focus this morning. But they all spoke in a different language. So, obviously, something unique was happening. But it wasn't just the effects, uh, the visual effects, and it wasn't just the result of the ability to speak in another language, which is an amazing thing. How many of you would like to speak another language? 
several of you. I'm, I'm in, I've been in the process, I stay in the process inconsistently of learning to speak Russian. I have not learned to speak it yet. <laughs> I know some words and phrases. But it is work. It fully engages the mind. The Spirit of God enabled these folks to speak fluently a variety of languages on that day. That was another dimension that they had never experienced. So something unique was happening here, and that something unique was the Spirit of God enabling these believers for what they were about to embark upon. Not only apostles, not only the apostles, but the 120 that were gathered there. And the Spirit of God filled and empowered the believers to begin to carry out this task of, among other things, bearing witness to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. They had spiritual enablement now, spiritual empowering that went beyond speaking in tongues. That was just a, one of the manifestations, but the key manifestations was a, a supernatural boldness to declare Christ in the context in which they found themselves in Jerusalem, which was still very hostile. I mean, you read the record of Scripture, and the, the priest and the elders, the Jewish elders, were still very much opposed and, and still very much engaged in keeping this message from getting out, in keeping this a concept keeping this idea of Christ from getting out. They thought they had, they thought they had been successful, but they hadn't. With the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his burial, they believed that they had been successful. But now he's risen, and there's ample testimony that he's risen. Now think about this. There's ample testimony that he has risen. And they still remain in their opposition. They still remain in that mindset and that disposition of heart to completely shut down the testimony, the witness, the message of Jesus Christ. That's astounding. It shows the depths of human depravity that all of humanity is capable of. But it's astounding that they have witnessed these events themselves. Now, I'm not saying that the risen Christ appeared to them. But they, they witnessed the fact of his arrest and of his trial and of his crucifixion, of the affirmation of his death by the Roman um, guards, who were responsible for certifying those, uh, those realities and his removal and his burial. They knew he was dead. They knew he was buried. They put guards of their choice at the tomb. They knew all of this. And now they're very much aware of the fact that the very guards that they selected to be at the tomb have now returned some days prior to this, and told them the events that they witnessed of the angel, of the declaration of the empty tomb. And indeed, the, 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 the whole scenario was that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And their response was, we've got to somehow manage the message. Things just don't seem to change a whole lot. <laughs> Do you think about managing the message? How often does that happen worldwide even today? People not wanting the reality of the truth of events to occur, and so they, they begin to think about not how true something is, but how can we manage the information? How can we manage the message? How can we control, control the narrative? That's exactly what they were doing. And so they created a narrative. They put it out there. And so the disciples and believers are gathered in this upper room in Jerusalem, a small group indeed, 
compared to the massive amounts of people that were there. And people with no leverage at all in society, in culture, in governance, but the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees had that presence, had that leverage, not only among their people, but with the Roman governor at that time. They had leverage on the guy. And they used that leverage. (laughs) They used that leverage to have Jesus Christ convicted as a criminal and crucified and put to death. I mean, that's leverage. It's the same people still in place with the same opposition. They need supernatural boldness to consistently now go out in the face of this opposition and proclaim Christ. They didn't realize that, but God did. As I mentioned, they were enthused, they were excited, they were ready to go. And Jesus said, you need empowering, you need enablement. From me. Because the opposition is far greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests and the elders that you daily run into. And so now, here is the historical point in which They are enabled, and from this point on, believers are enabled by the filling of the Spirit of God and empowering of the Spirit of God to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And just as these first century believers needed the enablement of the Spirit of God, believers in every century, right up to the present, need the enablement of God to be consistent, effective witnesses of and for and to Jesus Christ. We need that enablement. Historically, this is where it started, and it continues to today, because we are indwelt by the Spirit of God, and we are empowered by the Spirit of God through the filling of the Spirit. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians, be you be being filled. Continue to be filled with the Spirit of God, and he goes on to talk about what that looks like. We need the daily enablement of the Spirit of God. And here we're talking about witnessing and being witnesses. We need that daily enablement. It's not enough for us to, it's necessary for us to know the gospel. It's necessary for us to have a desire and enthusiasm to be a witness. But that is not enough. Those are necessary. We need the enabling and the empowering of the Spirit of God. We need to access that daily. We need to pray for boldness. We need to pray for empowerment. We need to pray for enablement daily as His witnesses. As we begin our days, each day, we need to pray for God's enablement and trust Him to give it to us. But that's acknowledging, Lord, it's another day. You've brought me through the night. I'm alive. I'm still here on this earth. I haven't departed this life. And one of the key tasks that you have for me and every one of my fellow believers is to be a witness of Jesus Christ. But Lord, to do that, I need your enablement and your empowerment. Every day, we need to acknowledge that reality. And so that's, it goes all the way back here, and our Lord said, wait, and then when you are empowered, you can go forth, and you can be effective witnesses for me. Enabled and empowered to be that witness with all the opposition and in the midst of all the opposition that you will encounter. So there's a responsibility uh, explained and enabled And now engaged, Acts chapter 2 through 28. And so that's Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 28. We're not going to read Acts 2 through 28 this morning. Uh, But this is a historical record of how, what this looked like. That's what Luke has given us with this book of Acts is and historical record of the beginning of the church and the spread of the church 
up through the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so we're going to see cities and people and conversions and people who've come to know Christ and churches that have come, in, that come into existence. And we're going to see the flow of that and, and a lot of drama in these chapters. So if you like drama, there's a lot here. If you're a drama person, there's a lot in the book of Acts. And so Acts chapter 2, this is where we've been. They're enabled, they're empowered. And Peter is always represented as a guy who likes to speak and talk. Um, perhaps he was. But he's speaking and talking here. Uh, and so here is Peter, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. And we'll get the verses up here. At Acts chapter 2, and verse 14, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. And so we're not going to read the entire message that Peter proclaimed at that point. But now he stands up with boldness, not arrogance, but boldness, genuine, humble boldness. He knew why he was there, and he had confidence from God and enablement from God, and so now he stands in the presence of these very people that not too many days prior to this, too many weeks prior to this, he hid in fear from these people, fearful of his life. And in the presence, perhaps, of some of these people gathered there that day, uh, before whom he had denied this one that he is now going to bear witness to, denying that he even knew him, and doing it with such intensity that he was cursing and swearing and saying, I, I don't know this guy. Don't associate me with him. And he was doing it out of fear. The same guy, but now he's standing up in the presence of Jews who can easily, even if there are no chief priests or anyone like that there, a number of these Jews can easily run to them and say, hey, this guy's standing in the temple and this is what he's saying. You better come check him out because I think you might want to do something about this. Boldness. Empowerment. To declare this message that you can read following this. It's amazing what he says here. And then Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, as we come to the close, in, uh, close of the message, and it says, and with many other words, he testified. That's the same word, bore witness, and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And so the witness culminated in this call to his fellow Jews that day, on the day of Pentecost, be saved from this perverse generation. <laughs> Those words don't sound too terribly diplomatic. <laughs> but that's what it was. It was a perverse generation. And his message was, you need to be saved from this perverse generation. And verse 41 gives a response that the Spirit of God enabled. Uh, then those who gladly received his word, took the word to themselves, were baptized. So they, they believed, and, and in confession of that belief, baptism was that outward uh, sign and that outward confession of their newfound belief in Jesus Christ, that they embraced this truth indeed. And that day about 3,000 souls or people were added. Amazing. I don't know that Peter ever again had that kind of a response. <laughs> Saw that kind of a response to his message. It was a response that God generated. So we move down to Acts chapter 3. And Peter once again. And in verse 12. Um, let's pick it up here. And. Leading into this, 
uh, man had, had asked Peter for assistance. In verse 6, he says, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. I wonder, I, <laughs> just the picture comes to mind, I wonder how we would respond if we brought somebody to church with us on a Sunday morning, and they came in walking, leaping, and praising God. I was like, calm down. <laughs> Peter didn't seem to try to restrain him any, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat beg begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Now as the, ma as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's greatly amazed. So that was... Uh, part of the temple so when peter saw it he responded to the people men of israel why do you marvel at this why are you marveling at this or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk and then he launches into another message another sermon another time to proclaim christ that's bearing witness he was bearing witness of christ and so that's what you read in the following verses. And so he responded. He talked. He spoke. Given the opportunity to do so and recognizing the opportunity to do so. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. And so here you have... The big boys. The big boys of intimidation. And the big boys who can put into effect the intents of their intimidation. They can follow up their words with actions and make it happen. You have the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They were really bugged about this. Instead of saying, being inquisitive, inquiring, and wanting to know, they're in opposition. They're in opposition because they're preaching Christ, they're bearing witness to Christ. And they're bearing witness in particular to the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And you'll see this emphasis from the apostles and first century believers as recorded in scriptures that a very clear and powerful part of bearing witness to Christ is bearing witness to the fact that he is resurrected, that he is risen. He's alive. And that is a particular point that is, has become diminished in present-day gospel presentations. Why? I don't know the answer to that. But I, I recognize that it has. But as we look at this, they bore witness to Jesus Christ, and that culminated with bearing witness to the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And therefore, everything that he proclaimed and everything that he asserted and everything that is um, preached about his, the purpose of his death is true and has been accomplished. And because he's risen from the dead, now we have a responsibility to respond to him, to the resurrected Christ. But again... In verse 3, let's just pick it up there. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. See, they, they not only had, they could not only intimidate with threats, they could follow through. They could make it happen. They could put you in jail, and they did. 
They thought that would, these kind of tactics would stop the witness. It would make those embracing this message of Jesus Christ fearful and afraid if they could just continue to layer on levels of intimidation and follow through on that and put him in jail and whatever other means they could use to drive their threats home all for the purpose of shutting them up. And these dynamics haven't changed even to the present day. But they were empowered by God. Verse 4, however, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of men came out, came to be about 5,000. So now they're up to 5,000. It's like, <laughs> that's a pretty good jump from 3,000 to 5,000. How many of you have IRAs or retirement plans or things like that in the stock market? Have you, have you looked at it in the last month? Pretty good jumps, right? Significant jump. And you go, wow, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, they had a significant jump in the number of people who believed and embraced the testimony concerning Christ. This took boldness. Folks, sitting here this morning, we know nothing. We know nothing. I'm not criticizing us for it. It's just the context. And we know nothing of this kind of intimidation. We do not have anyone directly threatening us in our well-being for our bearing witness of Jesus Christ. That is not an obstacle to us. in this part of the world in the 21st century. In some parts of our world in the 21st century, believers are faced with that, but not here in America. God has blessed us to be here. He, he, he brought this nation into existence, and he brought it into existence with the governing philosophy that we have, and a key component of that is freedom of religion, and with that, freedom of speech. And we have these freedoms that, that we can all enjoy together. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we can openly bear witness of Jesus Christ. Oh, there will be people who, who uh, will you know, make fun of us, perhaps, uh, perhaps deride us, perhaps put us down or put down our message. Uh, who, who might criticize or demean. But that's about the extent of it. We're not going to be threatened with jail. That's not going to happen. We're not going to be threatened in other ways. Now, an employer might, you know, if you see something on Facebook, somebody might say, well, that's going too far. I'm going to pulled the plug on you. I haven't seen that happen. Um, but we just don't face that. But these guys were thrown in jail. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together in Jerusalem. So this is everybody. This is setting a context for letting you know, for, you know, they're saying, we've got to make a statement here. You look at the list of people who are showing up here, it's all the big boys. They're flexing their muscle. They're flexing the level of intimidation. They are all gathered here because they're wanting to nip this in the bud now. This must stop. We've got to get a handle on this. We've got to shut it down. That's the message behind all of them. 
And when they, verse 7, and when they, asked, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? It's like, duh, haven't you guys been listening? They know the answer to that question. They're just wanting to get it on record. Then Peter, verse 8, let's see what we got up here. Yep, that's where we're going next. Then Peter, what? Filled with orange juice? With the Holy Spirit. Empowered. Enabled. So here you have the scene of all the big boys. This, let's try to put it on an equivalent stage here. Any of us in this room, because that's what these, the equivalent of the apostles and the 120 believers is you and us, as far as having any influence, leverage, significance in the culture in which we live, society in which we live. And so we're brought, one of us is brought before the president, the vice president, the Supreme Court, the, the nine judges of the Supreme Court, the House majority leader and whip, the Senate majority leader and whip, and the key media outlets. And everything is gathered there. And we know it's all in opposition to us and, and to us only for one reason, because of the message that we proclaim. If we, if we move away from the message or denounce the message, we're all good. And, and that's where Peter was. So in verse 8, it says, Then filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So he speaks respectfully to them. That's very important. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. <laughs> it's like, Peter, you don't need to say that. Do you know, you know who you're talking to here, Peter? These guys can do a number on you. It's fine to say that Jesus Christ resurrected, but don't tell him again that you crucified him. Peter, what are you doing? These are people who like to manage the message. But empowered by the Spirit of God, he said, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. You crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. By him, this man stands here before you whole. Wow. <laughs> That's empowering by the Spirit of God. That's boldness. Not cockiness, not arrogance, but boldness. And then he goes on to preach a message. So he spoke. One of the greatest challenges for us in witnessing is speaking. <laughs> it's talking about Jesus. About the gospel. Not just about Jesus like in general terms in non-specific terms, but Jesus Christ. Crucified. Risen. Crucified for our sins. So that's one of our greatest challenges is, is speaking. And so they spoke. Notice the verbs that are used here. Acts 4.13. As we read it in the scriptures, it says uh, in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, it wasn't Peter coming in going, I'm not afraid of you guys. I saw the resurrected Christ, and I'm going to lay it on you. I'm not afraid of you. You can't do anything to me. You're not going to intimidate me. Uh-uh, not me. Sometimes I do that, and I, that, that, that's over the top, so to speak. But it's to illustrate the fact that boldness doesn't mean an arrogance. Boldness doesn't mean bring it on. 
Let's go out, mano a mano. I'm ready to take you on. No. Respectful, humble, boldness. So he goes, he says, they recognized the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated. <laughs> uneducated. <laughs> and they were, they didn't have any equivalents of educational training as it was um, understood in those days and recognized in those days. In our day, we'd say, you know, haven't been to college, haven't been to graduate school, you haven't been. Maybe, maybe the equivalent that they had was a GED. <laughs> they, they recognized that they were uneducated and untrained. Untrained by whom? By, by them, by their system, by their schools. Uh, these guys, they, they don't have the qualifications that we would normally look for, and yet they marvel. Look at what these guys are doing. They're, they're, they're uneducated. They're untrained. They haven't been educated in our educational system. They haven't been trained in our systems of training. And yet look at them. And, and they, they made an unmistakable connection. And they perceived that they had been with Jesus. Because they talked the way he talked. They thought the way he thought. And they had a boldness that Jesus had. That's what it takes. We need the boldness of God, the Spirit to be effective witnesses. That's, 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 we see it in the history here. Acts 4.31, toward the end of this chapter, as Peter continued to lay out truth before them. And if you read, as we read through the message, you can read through and, and see he's, he's not having a personal vendetta here. He's not saying, Jesus is risen and we're going to let you have it now. We're going to rub your noses in it. You know. No, he's laying out truth because that's what they need to hear. And in being a witness for Christ, what people need to hear is the truth. The truth of God as recorded in Scripture. And that's what you see here. Let's pick up verse 27 as we work our way down to verse... Oh, my goodness. We are beyond our time here. But I'll finish with this, okay? Okay. I was so wrapped up in it. Must have been God. <laughs> not really. It was just me not paying attention to the clock. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats... And grant to your servants that with all what? Boldness they may do what? Speak your what? Word. Boldness, speak God's word. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Wow. That's a history. That's the first taste of the history. God's empowering Boldness resulting, speaking, issuing forth concerning Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the time that we've been able to gather in your word, and we ask that indeed we would continue to meditate on what we've seen 
and uh, been exposed to this morning again. And Lord, that uh, indeed we would uh, afresh and anew focus on uh, our great call and our great privilege of being witnesses to and of and for our Lord Jesus Christ in our time, in our generation, in our part of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.